By his word, God created all things. Get ready to be recreated and repositioned for greatness as you listen to this inspiring message. Open your spirit and let the word of God give you light and fresh inspiration. Father, in the name of Jesus, I turn this moment over to you. I ask that you loom large in this place. Cast your influence upon this assembly in the name of Jesus. I ask that the glory of God will overwhelm this house in the name of Jesus. That as your word goes forth, your power will go forth. I ask that my words will carry weight even as I minister under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, let your word transform. Let it reform. Let it reshape. Let it renew. Let it give direction to somebody. Let the power of God be made manifest in the name of Jesus. I ask that your name be glorified in Jesus' name, I pray. I said in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, from there we'll go to 2 Kings chapter 4, and after that we'll do Luke chapter 19. I love the Word of God, and it must always be the basis for which we teach anything. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Second Kings chapter 4, we should be familiar with this. Uh, we've read it. This will be like the third installment now. Second Kings 4 verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. So people who fear God can die broke. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Because spirituality doesn't always equal prosperity. You must follow certain principles. So Elisha said to her, mm, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full, verse 6, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said, mommy, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons leave on the rest. Tell your neighbor, pay your debt. Mm -hmm, before you leave on the rest. Luke chapter 19. And I'll start from verse 11. I'll start from 12, actually. Luke 19, 12. Therefore, Jesus said, A certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minors. In other words, each person got a minor. And said to them, Do business. Till I come. Tell your neighbor, do business. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, nonetheless, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money, so the minor is money, to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. How much every man had gained by by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your miner has earned ten more miners. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you are faithful in a very little, uh, have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your miner has earned five miners. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your miner, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere, strict, demanding man. You collect what you did not deposit. Is that true? You reap what you did not sow. And the nobleman said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. 
You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? I might have collected it with interest. God is a profit-oriented God. God likes profit. God is looking for profit. There is nothing that God created that does not serve a purpose. There is nothing that God has created that does not produce anything, especially animal and plant life. There is nothing that God has created that does not serve a purpose, and there is nothing that he has created that does not uh, produce anything. You look at Adam, after God created man, interesting, the first words that man heard from God was, be fruitful. Or the first words were, be fruitful. God could have said, Adam, worship me. God could have said, Adam, fast. God could have said, pray. But God chose to say, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. The first words that man heard. Anything that is not fruitful is not fulfilling the purpose of his existence. Or should I say, anyone that is not fruitful is not fulfilling the purpose of their existence. And being fruitful there doesn't just mean have children because Africans, when they say be fruitful, 20 children, 30 children, one man. No, it means be productive. Let your mind invent things. Be creative. Actually, poverty as used in the Bible most of the time just means non, a non-productive person because lack of creativity often always equals poverty. So he says, be productive. Get yourself doing something. The only time Jesus Christ ever expressed, you know, uh, anger to a level where he even brought a curse was when he saw a tree that was not fruitful. He said, no man shall be able to eat from you again. You are not fulfilling the purpose of your existence. At another time, he saw another fruit. He said, why is this tree using up the soil and not producing fruit? In other words, why is this person using up space and they are not producing fruit? He said, get them out of that place. Get them out of that office. Get them out of those privileges because they are not making the most of it. And you see that in the parable. That same guy that said, I just kept the money in the handkerchief. In the handkerchief. He said, why didn't you give it to the bankers? Because the bankers know what to do with the money. If you don't know what to do with it, then you don't deserve it. And so anything that is not fruitful gets God angry. Why is God like that? It's because God himself is a businessman. And a day is going to come, he's coming to demand for the returns on his investments in all of our lives. Because God is a businessman. Everything he does is with the purpose or the intention of multiplying it. Now, when Elijah told the woman to go sell the oil and to live on the rest, all he was basically telling that woman is, do business. Get into oil business. He didn't just say, pay your debt. Say, go sell. And leave, I told you that day, he said, and leave on the rest. You must know that even if she was 70 years and she lived for eight, she lived up to 80 years, for 10 years she couldn't have just lived on seven barrels of oil. That means after that experience, she got into a business of getting, buying, and selling, of multiplying and increasing. So the man said, Go and leave on the rest. In other words, get into business. I've shown you a business idea. Uh, get into business. So he helped her to see the power of trading. And trading basically is buying and selling. And that is at the heart of every business. Buying and selling is at the heart of every business. Every business is either buying or selling goods or services. Or at least they are creating value. So for this widow to be self-sustaining, Elijah said to her, do business. Now in the parable of the miners, the nobleman, of course, there represents a type of Jesus Christ. Also shows us the importance of trading or of trade. Shows us the importance of trade. Now, before traveling, he delivered his miners to his servants and told them, do business till I come. Do business till I come. That was what he said to them. Now, I know that as I said, if somebody, somebody is thinking, and it will look like that, that I'm saying everybody should go and get to do business. And there's some truth in that, and I'm going to balance that on Friday. Because if you look at these people, uh, that the monies were given to, they were working under somebody. 
Yet he said to them, it wasn't their business. It was the God that said, do business. And so even while under an organization, they were doing things that were tantamount to business to help the organization to be better. They became business people within the organization. Helping the so so it's not he it, it, it didn't say just get out of this place and go do business. So business does not necessarily mean be on your own. It's a lot of that, but it doesn't all only mean that. But I'll explain that better on Friday. So you must be here Friday by 6 p.m. So it is quite instructive what Jesus Christ said. Now, of course, the vital message in this parable is talking about end times. God is going and then he will come back and ask what we have done with the opportunities and the gifts that he has given us. Uh, but the silent instruction in, in this place is that you should do business. That you should all become businessmen. All of us, that we should be business people. Now, the Greek word used in this place for do business, I think King James says occupy, uh, is a word that means to go and trade. It's a word called pragmato something something in Greek. Uh, Pragmatoma or something like that. So it suggests to busy yourself with doing something. Busy yourself with doing something. It is to trade. It is to use the resources that have been given to you to the utmost. It is to carry on the business of a trader and of a banker. To carry out the business of a trader or a banker. And I'm like, business of a banker, and then it occurred to me that really what bankers also do is just trading, really. They just, they just, it's borrowing and lending. They just collect from you, lend to another person at an interest and give you back, and it's really trading at the most elementary level. Of course, they do other things, and so it means to trade. So Jesus Christ was saying to them, get into trading, get into trading, trade, exchange goods and services for something, create value. And when King James says occupy, that's where we get the word occupation from. They say, what's your occupation? In other words, what, are you, what is occupying you that is bringing profit into your life? Trade. Do something. Now, why is it important to do business? Three quick things, why right? Businesses are important. Businesses help to build the economy of a nation. The more we do businesses, the more the nation prospers. So sometimes we are waiting on the government, but if we collectively begin to produce creatively, we will create uh, a, an economically viable nation. So uh, 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 business helps to build the economy of a nation by providing goods and services and also employment creates jobs. Because, of course, government will be able to take tax, uh, taxes and all of that, and some businesses will help government to get foreign exchange. Number two. It, I like this one a lot. It is true business that we get almost everything we need and use around us. It is through businesses, almost everything you use around you. Businesses produce your phone. Do you know that? It's a business. Samsung, they are businesses. Uh, Apple and every Infinix, Gioni, they are businesses. Your clothes, the business that produces it. This microphone, a business. That chair you are sitting, they contracted it to a particular business. It's amazing for me. This was revelational and revolutionary. That, that's it. I, seen, I just really looked at almost everything around you, even the clothes you are wearing, produced by a business. Your internet access that you have, a business is producing it. Almost everything around you. So you see the importance of businesses. If there were no businesses, individuals will have had to produce their own microphone. They will have had to produce their own uh, uh, tape recorders, produce their own TVs. But businesses do that. And sometimes they move from one business to the other before they get to you. So you can see that businesses are very, very important. They produce almost everything. Buildings are built by businesses. For you know it's so-so and so a construction company. So-so and so architectural firm. Businesses all around. They, everything that you have produced by businesses. I want you to think a little about that. Number three, businesses create platforms for people to express their God-given gifts in creative and challenging ways. B businesses, they create up platforms and opportunities for people to express uh, uh, their, their God-given talents uh, and, and gifts in very creative and challenging ways. Businesses will extend them to, uh, will, will, sorry, will cause them to extend themselves in management, in uh, emotional intelligence, in human resource, people management, in financial planning, financial intelligence, uh, in, uh, in, uh, 
uh, in a policy making, just different things. Business will stretch you in production, in publicity, advertising, in planning. Business puts that demand on you. Business. So they are important for three reasons. Number one, they help to boost e the economy of a nation. Number two, they produce almost everything that we use. I'm putting almost there because I've not really thought. Maybe there will be a few things. But check, almost everything produced. Fruit juice, business. Wine in your house, businesses. Water that you drink, businesses. Businesses. And lastly, they stretch us. They stretch us. Now, it is important that you start and own a business. It is important that you, listening to me right now, start and own a business. Everybody can do it. You know why I say everybody can do it? In that parable, he didn't leave any, anyone out. He gave all of them a minor. And he said to all of them, do business. He didn't say, well, it's just four of you that have acumen for that. To all of them, he said, do business. Do business. Those who think they can't, don't just have their eyes open yet. Because even for that widow, she didn't know she could until Elijah said to her, you can until Elijah showed her the things that she could do. So if you think you can't, your eyes have not just been opened yet. Revelation has not come yet. You have not seen what to do yet. But for everybody, for God to have said, be fruitful, and God will not demand what he has not put in you. Now, you know, you can't get fruit without seed. I want you to listen to me. You guys are not, are you with me? Is it possible to get a fruit without a seed? So when God was saying to Adam, be fruitful, God was saying you already have the seed. You have what it takes. And the seed exists in you as potential, as talent. And so God didn't give Adam a chair or a table. He hid the chair and table in a tree. And he's saying use your, the seed of ideas, of creativity within you to go to that tree and pull out the chair from the tree. And so that God begins to open your eyes to see everybody can't do it. Now, some people are afraid to launch out to do business, and the reason sometimes is because uh, the way our educational system uh, is even structured, and I know some of us have heard this, the way it structures uh, two theories, uh, basically the white people did it to keep us under subjection, so we are not made to, you know, be, you know, be individual in your thinking, to be adventurous, uh, to be innovative. You just follow what is in the textbook. And if you also notice things like research and all of those things are very, very, at their, at their very rudimentary, elementary level in most of our institutions. In fact, when I was in school and I did computer, even though I read architecture, we had a course on computer. All we did was on the blackboard. And we we're learning about computer. And so you, you see, and, and also, so some people also say because uh, when the colonial masters came and they were running the government, they just needed people to help them run the government. They needed clerks, and so they needed to teach them the basic thing that can assist them in running a government. And that's why it's like government is the biggest employer, the civil service, in quote, what we call the civil service mentality. That people can't just be innovative, be creative, be inventive, to come up with things that will shock the world. So many people are afraid because of that. But there is more. So all they are looking for, get a good education and get uh, a secure job. Now, starting and owning your business is considered one of the most powerful vehicles of wealth creation. Starting and owning your business is considered one of the most uh, powerful vehicles of wealth creation, if not the most powerful. He check all the rich people in the world today. I was checking Jeff Bezos, Amazon, business, Bill Gates, business, all of them. Maybe a few. Some will have maybe their investments in real estate, in the capital market and stocks and all of those. But check all of them. They are business people. In fact, if you have that chart, if you can put it, I sent a chart this morning. I don't know if you got it. Uh, if it so I checked the, the, the newest entrance into the billionaire level. Some people have just entered that group. And I checked, what are they really doing that is making them become billionaires? So all of them business people. Some of them in health. They're doing business. Do you have the chart? Okay, you don't. That means you didn't check your mail this morning. I should have confirmed. I'm sorry. Uh, so some of them are into technology. Some of them are into health. Some of them are into uh, production. Some are diversified investments. But these people have all come into the billionaire. I'm not talking in Naira, in billions. In, sorry, I'm, thank you very much. In dollars, not in Naira. In dollars. 
because they have found a niche in business and they started to do something. So you check the world over. Even Dangote in, in Nigeria here, business, 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 business. Follow me. I'm going somewhere. Now, business is the ability to organize systems, to organize systems for the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. It is the ability to organize systems. Uh, we're putting things together so we can produce something and distribute it in order for people to consume it. That's really all you are doing. So you're now saying, how do we package it? How do we arrange it so that we achieve these three goals? That's really what business is about. It is the practice of making your living by engaging in commerce. By engaging in commerce. So still talking about business and these big guys I just mentioned. You look at uh, life, for example, many parents today, uh, and I've seen that the boy is three years old. He already has an Arsenal jersey. He has uh, soccer boots. He has football. Because the father is training him, this boy, you will play soccer. Because when they check what uh, Ronaldo earns in a month, when they check what um, Messi earns in a month, and then, or what the Serena or Venus and what that, that, those sisters, what they end by playing lawn tennis. So you see a two-year-old child has a tennis, that, the tennis racket that they are dragging like this. Because the parent has said to the child, you must make money. Because there's a lot of money there. But you know what? The real people making money in sports are the people doing the business of sports. Not the people playing the sports. So I'm saying, can we train our children to be owners of clubs or to buy into Arsenal Football Club or Manchester Football Club or to buy into Real Madrid. You buy into Real Madrid, your pepper will rest. Can we begin to look at that? So sometimes we engage at the most elementary level. Why? Because it's money that, and you know, those clubs, they don't really announce what they earn. What we see is what the players earn. And what is driving us is really money. Not value production. Not, not business. And so you check in everything. I was checking WrestleMania. I like, I like wrestling. It's a family thing at home. We're watching wrestling and all of that. And then you see all these wrestlers. You see um, Roman Reigns. Whoa! If you watch wrestling, you know what I mean. I go and check what they are worth. Their net worth. Maybe some hundreds of thousands of dollars or a few millions. You check uh, the man, Becky Lynch. You check all of those people, how much they earn. Then you go to the man called Vince McMahon. Is that his name? The owner of WrestleMania. Then you see billions. What he owns. He gathers them together. They take all the punches. They take all the body slams, all the deep six. They take all those moves. The guy is smiling. He just, he just has good script writers. The business, and when you, I like to watch WrestleMania, sometimes not for the fight, for the business mind of those people. They keep evolving it. They keep transforming. They keep adding something. They have amazing script writers because some of those fights are just scripts. They have amazing script writers, uh, people, DJs, all kinds of light experts so that when you see the final presentation, they have moved it from wrestling. They are taking it to entertainment. The business mind, the business mind to take it and take it to the next level. And so we need to begin to think like that. Now, we can see certain instructive patterns in what Jesus Christ said in that parable, the parable that Jesus Christ said. Certain patterns that show us the laws of trade or the laws of business. I'll still talk about some things, but let me just throw a little of them in. As you look at the parable that Jesus Christ spoke, for every business, capital is needed. The Bible says he gave them 10 miners. For every business, you need capital to start. And sometimes the capital may not even be money. It may just be mental, maybe intangible wealth. For every business, time and opportunity must be given to it. The business must be exposed to proper prospects. So it's giving them uh, time. So it takes time to go. So he didn't give them the money and expected returns the next day. He went into a far country. And a process of time, expecting the business to grow. So you don't start a business today and expect it to begin to give you returns by the end of the year. No, it takes time. It takes time. And it must be, ex you must be given the right prospect or exposed to the right opportunities. Exposed to the right opportunities. In other words, I will be selling water where they really don't have water. Or I go and dig a borehole in a place where uh, the water board has cut their thing and I can sell water from there. Where it, the right prospects, where it is needed. So that is another thing that every business needs. 
Another thing every business needs is that it must start small. It must start small. It gave them just one minor. So you start from retail into wholesale. You move from retailing into wholesaling. If there's any word like that. Into wholesale. So it began with them with one. And then when they traded with one, it gave them ten cities. It gave them five cities. So don't start, don't start a business and you want to start big. When I enter the market, eh? I will so show them, or when I start importing my this or that, importing or exporting tomatoes, I'll just plant tomatoes, you know, 500 hectares of tomatoes, and you've never done it before. You'll be shocked. When you have rotten tomatoes in your hands, when you have tomatoes harvested, you don't have a market, you don't have buyers for it. And so you start small, so that if you fail there, uh, your losses are minimal and you can learn from there. So you start from retailing. So don't say, I'll open a bookshop and stock it with 10,000 books. No, just start perhaps with 300 and see and check the market and test the market. He gave them one. And as they were faithful, he made them rulers over cities. Business must be a win-win for everybody involved. Especially for us as Christians, we must not set up businesses to defraud. It must be a win-win for the investor because the nobleman came back and asked for return. So he had 10 for the one that he gave. And for the person who traded, he was given 10 cities. So business must be a win-win for all. For the investor, for the business person, the seller or the trader, and for the buyer at the other end. So for three people, for the people, so if I put, uh, let, me, let me use big gamma, I put 100 million naira in your business, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be crying. I should be at least maybe every month be getting 500,000 or getting maybe a million from that. So I'm benefiting and you should be making maybe like 5 million every month. And the people you are serving should be going home smiling, saying I thank God for that business. It should be a win-win for all. If you are missing it in one of these levels, something is wrong with your business or you are not doing it right or you are just a wicked person. Because it must be a win-win for everybody. And lastly, the trading season is often limited. It says, I will return. So you don't have all the time for trading. But what that really means in our context is the fact that you must study, and I said that before, you must study trends and the cultures, and, and the needs of the people, because people will not always wear five button suits. There was a time that five button suits were raining. If you stay there, say, I'm a self-suit that you button up to your neck. Trend will pass you by. So you must also be, uh, be aware of that, that you must be sensitive to seasons, and to also know that I won't, this thing may not always be in vogue. It may not always trend. So I can't stock it forever. Especially those who even have supermarkets will understand this very well. Because every product you have has an expiry date. So you are more careful. You are more determined. So you don't, in August, go and buy something that the expiry date is in February next year. And you buy 2,000 of those products. So you must know that it is limited. So from that parable, uh, Jesus was already teaching some of these basic things about business. Now... I'll tell us things you must know or to understand in how to start a business. So, and these are the things I'll continue next. So I'll, I'll do a number today. Wherever I stop, we'll continue uh, next week. How to start a business. Now, some of you are already businessmen. are like, yeah, Pastor, I've, I, I know that. I've done that, been there. I've done that, been there. I even have a T-shirt to show for it. But some people, this will be a revelation for them. This will help them. And you can still learn. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I'm not an expert business person. Uh, so let me give that caveat right now. I am only a pastor. Mm -hmm. Don't say my pastor said. Uh -huh. uh, but of course, I'll be speaking from the word of God and from uh, tested principles. Now, I will advise you that if you want to start a business in importing cars from abroad or something, talk to somebody who's already doing it. So in any chosen field you want to, in addition to what your pastor has said, go and also learn and talk to people who are already doing it. Are we together? So the first thing you want to do is to eliminate fear from your heart if you want to do business. You have to eliminate fear from your heart. And fear will come if you want to start because it is a journey into the unknown. So number one, to start a business. Identify the needs around you. Identify the needs around you. And the basic step to doing, the, the, sorry, the basic step to doing business is to make sure that you are meeting or responding to a genuine need around you. 
that whatever you are doing is meeting and responding to a genuine need. In other words, the first skill to develop is to develop the ability to identify needs, to see needs, to see what the people need. And a simple way to do this sometimes is to check your own life. What are my needs? What would I like to have? What do I go every day to the supermarket to buy? What would I like to have? What do I go every day to get? Just looking at yourself, at your family, you can begin to see what people need. And needs abound everywhere and every day. People will need houses. And those houses will need, so that's a business need right there. And those houses will need furniture. And that's a business need right there. And those houses may need paintings. And that's a business need right there. That's a need right there. Uh, and those houses may need blinds and curtains. That's a business idea somewhere. People have needs. Uh, those are goods that can be provided. People need toothpastes. And people need toothbrushes. People need to wear clothes. That's a business right there. And a business idea, right? People need shoes. Especially Nigerians, we like clothes. People will need phones. Phones will need accessories. Batteries will get spoiled. That's a business idea right there. So just check and there are needs everywhere. Everywhere around us. And to move it from even goods, let's move it to services. Marriages will need counseling. They will need being fixed. So somebody can set up a marriage counseling outfit. Hmm? Students will need to be taught. True or false? People will need to be taught. Organizations will need trainings for their staff. So there are, there are needs every day staring you in the face. In fact, there's somebody sitting between, beside you right now and they have a major need. But you just need to discern it because we all have need. And sometimes the need may even just be an honest person. So if you're also an honest person, a trustworthy person, it may also be the value that you are bringing to the table to meet a need. Because there are people in offices right now who have 50 million naira to invest. They don't have the time. They're only just looking for a trustworthy, a credible person. And that may just be what you will exchange. So there are needs everywhere. So for you to succeed in business, you must first, you must first identify a need. Your business must solve a problem. It must fulfill a need. Or it must offer something that the market wants or the market needs. Even if you're a student, you must say to yourself, what do the students need? Oh, maybe they use the same textbooks that you have to use. They've just announced, ah, uh, this semester we'll be using so-so textbook, they write five. You know, you can go to Lagos, get transport, and say, guys, give me contributions. Or call somebody in Lagos. And they say, ah, we have those, that, those books in Balogun at so-so price. They say, how much? They say, 2,000 for one. You call your classmates. Maybe your neighborhood is not there or it's like 5,000. Say, I can go get these books for everybody for 4,000 naira. You can start like that. Their hair will grow. They need to cut their hair. You can learn babbing before you go to school. There will be needs everywhere. Everywhere. So you must learn to discern needs around you. Are we on the same page? Number two, you must identify your own gifts, your own unique gifts. Because at the end of the day, when you have identified needs, the needs you want to uh, answer are the ones that best fit your gifts. Are the needs that best fit your gifts, your training, or your experience. Those are the ones that you want to respond to because your experience, your gifting, your wiring has fitted you or have fitted you for those needs. They, it, they, it just makes it easier for you because your, your treasure is in your talents. Your wealth is in your wiring. So you must understand that. And your gold is in your gifts. So you must know that what God has placed inside you is what will trigger your prosperity. If you can discover it and deploy it properly. So you must also be able to identify your own gifts. Sometimes it may be the things that match your training or your experience. Or what you have learned from a previous job that you want to deploy in your own business. Number three. Start a business, improve on what exists. Improve on what already exists. Because in actual sense, you realize that the goods or services that you want to provide are already being provided by other businesses. There's hardly anybody that does anything new. Only once in a while, somebody will have a breakthrough idea. But most of the time, what you want to do is already being done. You want to go into fashion, somebody's already there. You want to import something, somebody's already doing it. You want to go into fish farming, somebody's already doing it. You want to do poultry, somebody's already doing it. But you want to 
uh, improve what already exists. Now, one thing you must understand is that man's basic needs will always remain the same. However, you can produce them differently. You can package them differently. You can present them differently. The needs will be the same, but what you can change is how it is produced, how it is packaged, how it is presented. You can, you can make the day. There was a time somebody just said, pounded yam will take uh, maybe like 30 minutes to 90 minutes to 30 minutes to an hour to boil yam and to pound it. Somebody said, well, it's still the yam. Can I get it and grind it and make ground pound, uh, pound oil flour available? And so somebody has taken what is already existing and repackaged it in another way. Sometimes you want to take what already exists and present it in a cheaper way. So there was a time when in those days, Ragolis bottle came and swan, and not many people could afford them. Then people started putting the water in a little nylon bag. They called it pure water. And then everybody could have access to water that has a semblance of purity. So you can take what already exists and make it cheaper. Sometimes you want to take a product, you've studied the market, and, and this will come from studying. I remember uh, when I just got married, and uh, well, always been like that as a young man, I like computer games. And in those days, it was PC. There were no PS4 and all of those things. Then. It has to be computer games. And it almost broke my marriage in the first year because my wife got come to bed 3 a.m. on the computer. So I had the privilege to go to America, and then when you buy a computer game, the box would be this big. Well packaged and all of that. And all that is inside is just a CD. And you are like, is it just for this thing? And you are paying like maybe $35 for just that CD. Just because the, I'm serious, the box will be this big. Uh, so what people are also doing that, just take the CD. You've cut up the money to print all the box and all of that. And put it in a smaller, simpler, nice package. And people get it cheaper. So the same game, if you did that, I can come to your shop. Maybe buy that $15 instead of the $35. Be the elaborate because at the end of the day, I throw the box in the dustbin. So those are things that people are doing or you can do to change things. And, and you know what? The market is not saturated. You just need to find a way to engage, to position yourself, to repackage, to represent. You just have to find a way. And you know what? I always tell myself that uh, no matter how saturated the market is, somebody still needs my product in my own way. Let us look at this scripture. It's interesting. It's in the Bible. Luke chapter 1. I, I like this scripture. Look at what Luke said here. Luke is an evangelist that wrote one of the gospels called the synoptic gospel. How many of you have heard the word synoptic gospel before? Synoptic gospel means similar gospel. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are all similar. Uh, so basically, this guy was writing what other people had, had written. Look at what he said. Verse 1. I'll read to 3. He was writing to King Theophilus. He said, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of the things which have been fulfilled amongst us. Hold on. He said, other people have taken it, you know, taken it upon themselves to write, to make a narration of the things that have happened. Okay? Verse 2. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. Verse 3. It seemed good to me also. You see the guy? He didn't write by revelation. You know, some of us are so spiritual. He said, it seemed good to me also. Having had perfect understanding, studying, read what Matthew wrote, read what Luke wrote, uh, uh, Mark wrote, asked some eyewitnesses, he got to a place of understanding. He said, it looks good to me too. It seems good to me. Having had perfect understanding, from the very first to write to you an orderly account Oh, most excellent Theophilus. He said, I must put my own. Yes, Matthew has written, but it seemed good to me also. Mark has written, it seemed good to me. That's one book that didn't come by revelation. And the Bible put it in the Bible. Or God allowed it to be in the Bible. He said, I, I think it's a good thing to do. Let my own too be there. Yes, they are doing phone business. Me too, it seemed good to me also. And then when you read uh, what um, uh, Luke wrote... It's, you know, apart from Matthew, maybe Matthew competes with it some. He brings out certain details, certain, certain juices because he actually had perfect understanding by research, by asking people. Look, one of my best of the Gospels. He said, because it seemed good to me also. Why? Because there's nothing that is on earth right now that is in its perfect state yet. 
can still be improved upon. Can still be improved upon. Nothing that exists right now is in its perfect state. Nothing. I read about somebody sometime. He was the, he was the head of uh, the, 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 the agency that used to give uh, licenses and patents in America. Patents. So when people invent something, he patented it and said, this belongs to a social person. He was quoted to have said, this, this man made this comment in 1967. He said, the world has seen the greatest of inventions. That he doesn't think anything will beat the things he has seen people create and invent that he has patented. And that man never saw internet. I don't think he saw a rocket. He didn't see the telephone as we have it right now, wireless telephone. He didn't see microwave. And he's saying, so I'm telling you, nothing is in his perfect state yet. If you say that today, I'm telling you, you will still be wrong. So everything can be improved upon. Okay, let me just run. I have a, okay, I'll just run through three more. Reality check, number three. Number four, I'm sorry, reality check. So you have received an idea by revelation. You've studied needs and all of that. You need to balance all of those things with reality. You need to do a research. Go do a market survey. You need to gather some facts and ask some questions. Do people need what I'm about to do? What I'm offering? Who is my target market? Is it for men? Is it for women? Is it for children? Is it for an organization? What kind of organization? Where are they? Where will they find my product? Is it online? How will they access them? Do I open a shop? Should it be in Wuse? Should it be in social place? Where should it be? What will people be willing to pay for this thing that will allow me to have good profit? What will people be willing to pay? Are there other companies offering similar products or services presently? What is the competition like? Or what will be my unique selling point? What will make mine different? You want to sit down? That's reality check. Yes, you have a fantastic idea. But you need to sit down and ask yourself some of those questions. Number five, draw up a business plan. Now, this is where many of us uh, miss it. Because Nigerians, we don't like to write. To draw up a business plan, you need to get your brain to work. Draw up a business plan. This is a working document that serves as a roadmap for your business. How you will start it, how you will sustain it, uh, the growth projections, the financial projections when, it to be est- when it's established and, and all of that. I had one for church. I don't know if it was professional, but I had uh, about, I think, a 15-page one that I wrote even before ILCC started. It should have your vision. It should have your projected uh, income, all of those things you plan, especially if you need, uh, okay, let me say it like this. It will be your basis for talking to investors. Because if you come to me and say, invest in my business, I want to see your business plan. I want to see what you are planning to do. I want to see, can this business sustain itself? Will this business generate an income? Is this business viable? Will this business last beyond three months? So it is important. And so you must write something down. It has your vision, your mission, what you want to do, your target market, uh, your break, uh, your return on investment, time that you will break even, and all of that, a projected profit, all of those things. And if you are seeking a bank loan, then you must get a professional to do it because bankers are trained to read in between the lines. So it won't be the, like the basic one I did. So if your business is at that level and you need uh, loans from the bank, then you also have to do it well. Now, it should be realistic. You be realistic when you're doing it. Be realistic. Now, number six, which is, I think, is the last one I may talk about today. Calculate your startup cost. How much will it cost me to get this business started? How much will it cost me to get this business started? Jesus Christ said, which of you wanting to build a tower will not first sit down and count the cost? To see if he has enough to finish it. Lest when he starts, he doesn't finish. And people laugh at him and say, see this guy. He started and he could not finish. And I'm telling you, there are many businesses like that. That were started. And today, they no longer exist. They only exist in the CSC certificate. They exist in the briefcase. They exist in a shelf in the house. Because somebody did not count the cost well to see if they were able to sustain it. To finish, And by the way, I'm saying this, all of these things I'm, I'm, I'm doing today is I'm trying to say to you that the kind of business I'm talking to you about is a business that will outlive you. It's something that will live for 15, no, 30 years, no, 50 years, 100 years. That you begin to think like that. That you think that your business is not just to put food on your table. 
And it is beyond that. It is to solve a problem and you want it to outlive you. And so when you are thinking like that, you want to sit down and count the cost. And you need to be realistic to calculate how much it will cost you to take off with the business and until it breaks even at least for the next 12 months. How much will it cost you? I did that for church actually. How much it will cost to have the church for... Uh, now, I didn't get all the funds I needed, but I have that document written. You know, look at rent, look at everything. You want to consider that. For some of you, even opening ceremony, the day that you open it and get people to come, you give them uh, finger food, shawar- shawarma, all of those things. By the way, next time you're opening your, your shop and you do shawarma, invite me. So, you want it to cost you to get it started. You check all of those things. The rent, check salaries, your salary. Staff salary, how many employees do you want to have? You need to check all of those things because if you don't, you keep struggling. You will start and your overhead will be more than what is coming in. And when, you remember our quote, if your outgo is more than your income, your upkeep will become your downfall. You guys have forgotten that. If your outflow exceeds your income, your upkeep will become your downfall. So you must check all of those things. Check the cost. What will it cost us to have this in place? The cost. Sometimes to get licensed, to get it registered, to talk to a lawyer, to do all of those things, to rent equipment, uh, to do branding, to do uh, consulting, if you need to consult with somebody. What will it cost us for marketing, for advertising, for production, for supplies, all of those things, you want to check and you want to be realistic. Be realistic. Don't just, you know, you can just project in our first month, uh, we will get, uh, uh, by the time we do this and do that and do this and do this and then touch that and do this, we'll make like 5 million naira profit in our first month and then da, da, da. You're a magician, you're not a business person. It won't happen like that. And you know what has spoiled us is our oil industry. Oil, oh, oh, quick money, quick money, quick money. And Nigerians are not ready to just stay with the business and build it little by little and let it grow and let it grow. I've realized that what you project most of the time is not what happens. So you must have a reality check. Even for, uh, as a church, oh, my projection for church attendance by now. I don't even want to tell you because even me, I'm ashamed. So you just have these big plans. You know, it will, be, it will be that and then this and that. No, no, no. Tell yourself the truth. Reality check. Look at the worst scenario that can happen and plan to manage that. With your business, plan to manage that. From next week, I'll begin to talk about other things, about uh, how to get capital. And then I want to talk on Friday, not next week, Friday. I also want to talk to intrapreneurs. Intrapreneurs are entrepreneurs within an organization. And Mr. Toebi began to tell us that about Jacob. Who is in the system? Because like I said, the people we saw in this uh, parable, they are working under a system, yet they were expected to be business-like in their thinking and in their engagement. So we'll talk about that. And you to amaze you, some of the things the Bible says, even you know, concerning business and concerning entrepreneurship. But as I close today, you know, as I look at that story again, the story of of, of these guys that were given the minor, and of course, you also see the same thing with the guy in the parable of the talents. So there will always be that one person that was given something and he didn't produce anything with what he was given. Jesus Christ calls him in the parable of the talent, wicked. That's what it was called. It is the spirit of wickedness that is not productive, that is not bearing fruit, that is not doing anything. It is a wicked spirit. It is a wasteful spirit. The Bible in Proverbs says that he who is a waster is a brother to he who is a destroyer. So it is as good as that guy, if everybody maintained this kind of mindset, they will bring that organization down in no time. And sometimes we've been unfortunate enough to have such people on our team. In fact, if I give you an example, one of the inspired to go we want to have this week is who is on your team? Who is on your team? So we are taking that from the guy in Joshua, Gideon. God told him to go and fight the Midianites. And he was afraid. 
And God told him, go to the camp of the Midianites and hear what they are saying. So he went to the camp of the Midianites and was listening. And one guy said, you know, I had a dream that a loaf of bread rolled into, the, into, a, into a camp and demolished the camp. And the other one that was being told now brought the gift of revelation. He said, ah, that's the sword of Gideon. He has finished us. He has destroyed us. He will kill us. And I'm like, how can you be a soldier in the team of the opposition? And that is how you are seeing your enemy. You are already saying that the guy has finished us. He's, on your, he's in your organization. Those are the kind of people you have in your shop. And they say, ah, in, madam, oh, you want a very good tie? Go to that next shop. You are selling in your shop. Oh. Because they don't even think that what you have is good enough. They don't even believe in the organization. So this guy said, ah, Gideon has finished us. He has finished us. And he's carrying a gun to go to war in this team. What do you have on your team? But you know, what leads to that is an inadequate understanding of who the boss is. Of the cost of the organization. He said, I perceived you to be an austere man. I perceive you to be demanding. To reap what you have not sown. To collect what you have not deposited. So ultimately in life, what we become is how we see God. How we see God. The other ones, the same, the same leader gave them the same. They were productive of it. But one on the same team had an imbalanced perception of who their leader was. 